speaker. We did this on purpose. We know we knew you'd be eating a big lunch and you'd come in here. It's a good time to sleep, but you're not going to sleep. We have a real exciting program for you. Uh, with us today is Ken Fink with Wonder G. And I just want to tell you a few things about Ken. Uh, he is one of the most interesting mixtures of uh, background. He has a background uh, both in science and in theater. He enjoys education. Uh, he actually has a, a bachelor's degree in physics from Columbia University. He has a master's degree in instruction from Drexel and just finished uh, the graduate marketing management program at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So he is no slacker. Uh, <laughs> what, Alex? You guys go to school every day too. What? You plan on stopping anytime soon? A lifelong learner. Uh, he has lots of fun things for us to do today, and I'm going to turn it over to him and tell you a little bit more about this crazy thing he does. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, first, of course, hi. Uh, hi. You now apparently know who I am, which makes life easy. Um, I've been wondering that for years now. <laughs> um, and I'm a demo guy. I, I started out, I, did, uh, I studied science, I did some teaching, I did theater for most of my life, and loved each piece of it and didn't want to do just one. And I have a feeling you guys do that a lot too. You bring in all sorts of different aspects of different, uh, different knowledge sets to do what you do. And my hope is here to encourage some of that. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what I get to blow up on a daily basis, um, we go to centers like yours a lot and play with things like liquid nitrogen and laser shows and sound and music and trying to get people playing with the stuff that's all around them already. And what we usually do is bring out fancy stuff that you wouldn't have in your classrooms. And you're going to all be sitting here saying, that's nice, but what are we going to do with that, right? So my goal here is a little bit different. My goal here is not to give you just, just to show you what I can do but hopefully to build um, a lot with you that you can take to your classrooms and use however you see best, however you see fit. Um, we blow all sorts of good stuff up. But uh, let's start simple. Um, I want everyone to just think back to something you probably did this morning at some point, with or without thinking about it. Um, look, look in the mirror. Yeah. So are you used to looking in mirrors? Then let me ask you a question. If you take a mirror and you want to see more of it, you, I'm sorry, you want to see more of yourself in it. Now you're naturally looking at yourself, right? Yeah. yeah. You want to see more of yourself in the mirror. What do you do? So some people say back up, okay? Who says, you know, I'll just show you. I have a mirror and everyone uh, has a mirror somewhere nearby. Don't do it yet. I want people to guess first. Um, if you take the mirror, and I see my, I'm looking at my face, and I can see it lines up with right about my, my chin and right about my forehead. I have a fairly large head, and I made these just so they more or less will line up. Um, and uh, if I want to see more of my face, do I move it closer? Do I move it further away? Or does it not matter? Let's hear some votes, because I hear everyone seems to already have an idea. That's good. So who says um, move the mirror closer to see more of yourself? Who says move the mirror further away to see more of yourself? Who says it doesn't matter either way? One very brave individual says it doesn't matter. It's going to work either way. Oh, two? Okay. Um, so give it a shot. See what happens. Try it. Pass it on. Let other people try it. And see what you notice. Right? 
So did you learn something by experience? So let's take another vote. Um, if you want to see more of yourself in the mirror, do you take the mirror and move it further away? Do you take the mirror and bring it closer together, closer to your face? Or does it not matter? Ah, notice a big change in perception, in, in our concept of what we do. Now, most, a lot of you end up working with kids that haven't been in the, in the world for very long. But they've already built a lot of expectations, haven't they? Yeah. So why do you think so many people in the room thought that it was that you moved further away, or that you moved closer or further away? Where would that experience have overlapped from? Where have you done that a lot before? Looks like a mirror. Does it? What's that? Could be in front of your own mirror. So if you step back with your mirror, who has a mirror that fits so they can see their whole body? And you step back, do you see more of yourself? Yeah. It's the same side, yeah. And yet, what about mirror, what about windows? We're used to looking, if you, if you see something out the window, you know, it's a beautiful snowy day, and the kid says, oh my god, it's a snowy day. What's the first thing they do? Go right up to the window, and now you can see more out the window, right? The closer you get to the window, the more of an angle you can see. Or if you imagine two people looking at each other through the window, and one wants to see more of the other, what would you do? Either have one person back up, or have one person get closer. Right? Does that work with mirrors? What are you looking at in the mirror? You. So you're looking at you. Can you get further from yourself? No, you're the same on both sides. You can go from this to that. Everything works out proportionate. And yet, we start with so many perceptions of things, so many assumptions, that we, we, we have a feeling of what's going to happen, even if it doesn't match our everyday reality. And by the way, this room, no offense, you guys are awesome, you're not special. This is, this is the statistical way this works out. You go to Harvard, they'll say the same thing in the same proportion. They actually did that. that that's where it started. You can say, look, you took all these Harvard graduates on graduation day and made them look stupid. No, not stupid. <laughs> It, but that's the thing. It's not stupidity. You're dealing with kids, you're dealing with adults, you're dealing with parents, you're dealing with all sorts of... And even yourselves, that we're, you, we take all these experiences that we already have and superimpose them on what we expect to happen. So, um, what I want to play with here is the idea that our senses are very limited things. We take what, our, what we learned from experience, we transfer that knowledge all over the place, sometimes in surprising places, um, and our minds end up doing the interpretation. It's a very specific, very limited picture of the world. Um, can I do a funny one? Yeah. Why not? Um, let's see if this is stable-ish. Um, I would like to stand on this. Can I just ask someone to make sure, there's two people to make sure this doesn't fall? Can I have one person stand on either side just in case the table decides to go? Okay. So since we're already playing with yours, Yeah. Yeah. But were you really saying it? Yeah. 
Yeah, it works every time. <laughs> yeah. So I hope the first thing I'm convincing you is that um, we see what we're expecting to see. We change around our view of reality. It's not a, a clean picture of reality at all. We don't have a real picture of the world when we take in information. When your kids are looking around and trying to figure out what they're seeing, they don't have a full picture of the world, do they? So the whole point is realize that. Start there. Um, and a lot of times the problem is we think we do. We think we do. I too often think I do, and once in a while I get caught on it. You probably think you do. Your kids probably think they do, because they're trying to make sense of their world. They're trying to control their world. So what I'm hoping we can do today is start to, start to do a couple of things. Um, the first idea is that we've got these, this sort of limited, um, this limited idea of, of the world around us, this limited picture. And what, I want, what, what I'm hoping we can see is that we're not limited by those senses. We can extend those senses. I want you to start seeing those senses as physical tools that you can use other tools to extend them with. So start seeing, by the way, um, where I ended up with this talk in the first place um, was uh, we were trying to figure out what would be a good thing to bring to you guys. And frankly, you made it hard. We started going to uh, preschools and watching, and we had this great idea. We said, we're going to go there, and we're going to tell them that it's, it's valuable to let kids play. You know that. <laughs> You're good at that. How about, it's good to let them play in new ways, try different senses, try different things. You're good at that, too. You, I, I heard before someone say, uh, the, the earlier speaker, say, well, you know, the, the parents think they have real jobs, and you know, there, isn't a, there isn't a very specific knowledge set that you guys are applying. You are and you made it hard for me to figure out something you didn't already have. <laughs> so my hope is that we can try to poke into a little bit of a paradigm shift here. Um, the idea that senses are these physical tools, and then let's play with some ideas, some demos, and a lot of it's going to be things that I want you to try here. Some I'll do up here, some you'll, you'll try. Um, I want these to be things that you can use, things you can take back with you. So. Those, the first two were really just an idea to give you, to, to kind of shake things up for you. You may end up doing something with your kids, probably not, it's a little sophisticated. Um, but what about just what you see, how you see things? Um, what do you see when you see things? Do you actually see things? Do you see things on the table? Yeah? yeah. Do, you see, do you see this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, how do you see this? Do you actually know it's there? Like, are you seeing the object? Yeah, think about it as a physical thing. What, okay, which sense are you using? You're clearly taking in the data somehow using your eyes. But are your eyes getting this? What are your eyes getting? Reflection of the light. Yeah, it's a physically limited tool, isn't it? So let's take it even, even another step further. Your, your, your eyes just collect light, and then you figure out what it means. Right? So your eyes collect light from this. That's nice. Is it doing something to the light? What's it doing to it? It's somehow, yeah, it's reflecting it, it's refracting it, it's somehow changing the light. And you see there's some difference there, and you say, oh, there must be a thing there. What if it wasn't making the difference? Would you see it? If a thing doesn't change light, could it be there? And you'd have no idea. Things can hide right under your nose, can't they? Um, so I guess one more that you probably won't end up doing with your class, but I want you to witness this one. Um, Maybe we start with a little bit of therapy? We have glass. What do you always afraid of glass doing? Shall we? Okay. So, who wants to do the honors? Oh, nice, nice. Okay, oh, wait, the hands went down. Any, any move oh, here you go. Okay. Keep it in the bag, please. Excellent. Okay. Is it still in there? Yeah. I'll go in the light. How do you know it's still in there? It's easy now. You can still see it, right? That's nice. 
but don't you wish you had a way to regenerate things in your class? You know, who's had things break in their class, in their school, yeah, at home? And you go, oh man, I can't believe it broke. But I have this magic regenerating fluid. And if you pour it in there, it will magically, well, let's try. So pour it all in there, get it in there, swish it around a little bit, hope for the best, reach in there, and, and it, it was put back together. You can say magic words or whatever you want. Okay. What was the trick? It was already in there. Could you see it? Yes. Can you see it now? Yeah. Ah, see, now you can see it. You knew, how'd you know it was there? I could see it, I could see it. If you're really up close and the light's just right, but that's also because the temperatures didn't quite match. But the neat thing is, when light passes, should I make it disappear again? Yes. Watch this, I'll try holding it up with my greasy hands. Ready? Hey, bye. Ah. Okay. You don't see things, you see the light that gets changed by the things. So, what's going on there? Yeah, that is, I, I don't know if you're going to want to bring glass and oil into your class. You don't have to break it, um, but that was just Wesson corn oil and Pyrex. It turns out that the speed of light, when it's in, uh, in, different, in different stuff, the speed of light changes. And if you've ever taken your car halfway on a dirt road and halfway on the pavement, what do you notice? Your car starts to veer off. So you end up with, this is something you can do in your class, right? Oh, look, it looks like it's broken. I never looked like it was broken to me. I was too used to it. I don't know. But um, the idea that things change where they appear based on what you're in. So as the light changes speed, it ends up getting bent. It gets bent, you see it. So what's the difference between when it's like that and when it's like that? Now there's half of it. Yeah. So if the light doesn't change, you don't see it. Do we use this on a daily basis? Stone. What's that? Stone bombers. <laughs> to stone people. Ah, you got a part of the trick now. <laughs> but does, do we get tricked all the time? Okay. Um, even this itself, this kind of tricking you a little bit. Um, you see the oil, right? It, does the oil go all the way to the edge? Does it look like it goes all the way to the edge? You can go grocery shopping, right? And you buy a bottle of something. You ever think about what that bottle really looks like? You see how the red stuff makes it to the very edge? Where's the glass? The glass looks like it's gone, doesn't it? And we buy this stuff and we have no idea how much liquid is in it, do we? Can't see it. Because the light has to change speed. Now this is what you'll probably want to do with your kids, because now you get into both sensory stuff, but you're also in, you know, you're actually dealing with consumerism in the real world. So give yourself some way to see what's going on in there. That's just uh, food coloring in the water. I just took some of the water out of here so it would be easy to see. So now, here you go, I just made the glass disappear, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, you saw there was glass there. And yet, if it doesn't have to change speed, now it's going from water to glass back to water, can you see the glass? Yeah. And if you go to the grocery store and you bring your little whatever of water, now all of a sudden you can see when you're getting ripped off. <laughs> this happens to us all the time. But again, we're used to, we're somewhere between used to it and we don't look out for it. We start thinking we see everything that's there. We don't. Yeah. We do it so often, and I alluded before to the fact that I was a bartender before. Ah, you have a bartender in there. Excellent. Just because the illusion that we were giving people a bigger drink mm -hmm. by changing the glassware, we used to give martinis and pilsner glasses, which was almost unknown, <laughs> because they were very, very, it's almost a funnel shape, very small at the bottom and flutes up. And the guys would come in and go, oh my god, look at the size of that martini. I don't know if I can drink that. Until one day I just went, guys, I put my hand over, I turned it over, there was this much liquid in the glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the glass was this tall, and they were thinking they were positively getting three times the drink that they were getting any other bar. Yeah. So, 
the next time you're serving your kids drinks. <laughs> but seriously, our senses are very, very limited. So, um, we don't see, so by the way, I'm going to try to put materials as we go through these things. Everything is on these sheets that you got. So it's got materials for each thing that we end up doing. Yeah, this is where we work. Um, the sheets are going to be just the uh, summary things, so you won't miss anything if you, if you look at the sheet later. If you want to take notes all over that, feel free. That's why there's lots of space. Again, yeah, there's a little materials list under each one of these things. Um, there's another thing that you've probably done with your class. I kind of just did it there, sort of. Um, but in, a, in, in sort of a, a different way. Um, who likes to mix stuff with their kids? Yeah? And it's one of those things that we also, again, just sort of don't think about that much. Um, one of the very popular things that we do at centers, at birthday parties, at pretty much everywhere, really, uh, is playing with liquid nitrogen and making ice cream. And uh, the, like, making ice cream really just ends up being the wrap-up of it. But when we're making ice cream, we inevitably put vanilla in. And I pull out one of these, and adults say, okay, cool, because you've seen vanilla before. But uh, what do you think kids say? They, they say, it's brown. They say, you. They say, that's not, I didn't vote for chocolate. Right? Coffee. Coffee. It looks like coffee. It does look like coffee, doesn't it? It's the right color and the right visco consistency, viscosity. It's sloshy enough, right? So it looks like something you're not used to. Fine. But you've... They've all tasted vanilla and things before. So where's the um, where's the dissonance? Where's the discrepancy? So are these different molecules from what were in the stuff you tasted? Not a bit. What's going on? Why does this look different then? Because there's so little of it? Ah, so this is where you're getting into a bit of a ratio problem. It's not that there's little of it or a lot of it. You eat the whole box of ice cream, you still didn't get through the bottle word, but you got more. Um, but it's how much in per, per scoop, per spoon, per whatever. Um, things can disappear just by being too darn small to see. Yeah? You ever take your kids on a field trip? Probably, this is a little early for that, right? But have you ever, so, so imagine with me, you go to a Phillies game. And, and you have a very misbehaved group and they all spread to the wind. Uh -huh. how, how easy is it to see each one of them in the stands? <laughs> but then you get them all wearing red shirts, still hard to see. Yeah. Then you get them all wearing red shirts, you get them to sit in the same section. It's easier to see. Yeah. When you mix things, each one of those molecules is too small to see. Put them all together, they line up, they bunch up, it's great, you can see them, you've got your group. Right? But then, as soon as you end up mixing your vanilla around, oh my god, it's gone! Is it gone? We have very limited senses of what's there. How do you know it's there, usually? Yeah. How do you smell? With your nose, what does your nose do? You suck all these little tiny bits in, right? And some of them go flying by your nose, some of them go flying through your nose, some of them stick to the sides. Right, so you got all olfactory bulbs, little pieces of your brain stick down in there, it's kind of nice. And, um, but when you smell something, it's because some of those little pieces of vanilla have done what? They've, they've flown away. They're flying around in the air itself, aren't they? Yeah. They, can you see them? No. It sounds silly when you tell someone you're bad. vanilla ice cream flying up your nose. If you, if you didn't have vanilla ice cream flying up your nose, would you smell it? So, again, you've got a physically limited sense, so I want to make sure people keep thinking of it in that context. But, I guess if you want to see the dramatic version, we can actually make something disappear into the air itself. Can you make water disappear into the air itself? Who has water play with their kids? Whose kids get wet anyway? That's it, probably everyone. So if you've got your kids playing with water and they get wet, do they stay wet? What happens to the water? It evaporates, but the first thing I heard someone said it disappears, doesn't it? Is it a magic trick? Sometimes it's just a matter of scale. So things disappear by spreading out. Can you see the vanilla? It's spread out. When water dries up, those molecules break off, fly away, and spread out. Um, if you want to see it faster, 
This stuff dries up kind of the same way water does. Nitrogen. Do you ever see nitrogen sitting around anywhere? You know why? Too easy to dry it up. Take a big deep breath. More than three quarters of what you're breathing right now is nitrogen. All dried up. The molecules don't stick together very tightly, so they won't stay together. But I'll throw some on the carpet so it can absorb the heat of the carpet, break away. Check out how quickly this stuff disappears. Ready? Three, two, one. Now you're really. There you go. The fog, by the way, is not nitrogen. The fog was water. What happens to the fog? It disappears too. So one of my favorite things to do with little kids, if I've got the fancy stuff, is make it disappear and say, it has to be hiding someplace, right? We're, we're at the point, you guys get, I'm so jealous, you get to see the transition between concrete thought and the assumption and abstract thinking. You get to see when they start assuming things don't go away. Good. That's awesome. I like to poke at that. I get to ask you a question. Yes, please. You can answer rather than the guys at the shop. They're now advertising everywhere you go. Get your tires filled with nitrogen. Ah. Why? Good question. Get your tires filled with nitrogen. Um, and by the way, the air is more than three quarters of it. So is everybody getting their tires filled with nitrogen? I don't have a definitive answer. I've asked the question at a couple auto shops. Why do you do it? Most of them say because it's better. Yeah. But um, can anyone make any guesses of what might be the reason you'd want to use nitrogen? They can charge you for it. <laughs> that's, that's why you market it. Yeah. But is there an actual advantage to it? I had the pleasure of working, of uh, actually doing a, a birthday party for it was uh, uh, someone uh, had a, a 40th birthday party, and uh, he had been in the military uh, as one of the uh, uh, people that serviced uh, helicopters. They fill their tires with nitrogen too, apparently. And he goes, why? The best guess we could make was the same thing that we just said about, uh, I mentioned that this stuff stays dried up most of the time, because those molecules, they, they don't tend to stick together. So you warm water up, you get those molecules bouncing around, they break off, they fly away, cool them back down, they stick to the mirrors, drip, and you take a shower, you see that out. Um, nitrogen, anything above its boiling point, it'll stay evaporated. Its boiling point is minus 320 Fahrenheit, and a little, a little more, a little colder than minus 320. So the best guess we could make is when things cool down and stick together, if they turn back into a liquid, they get much denser, on the order of 500 to 1,000 times denser, which means you're going to lose the pressure in your tires if you get like in freezing temperatures. So our guess was you put nitrogen in there instead of water vapor, so you can um, keep the tire pressure. Even if the helicopter's way up high and it's really cold and doing all sorts of crazy stuff, okay. you still got tires to land on. But in That's our, our guess. In our know. cars, we lose on average a, a pound of air per month, kind of, sort of. Really? Well, if you've ever, yeah, I'm on the motorhead too. But anyway. I've been lucky. <laughs> okay. I still don't see the advantage. Of it. I, I don't. My guess is uh, around here there probably isn't a big advantage, possibly in freezing temperatures. There may be another reason, maybe the, the oxygen helps the t inside of the tires start to degrade. I don't know. Um, that's a very good question. And by the way, that's, uh, I, you guys probably aren't at the point of dealing too much with specific content knowledge with your kids, are you? You're using a lot of, of skills in specific contexts, but you're not getting questions like, what's the reaction between, or why would you, or... Um, but the first thing I always try to do when I train teachers that do work with contact, content, is show them that I don't know everything. Just because I'm tall, just because I have a microphone, I'm not even that tall, um, doesn't mean I'm right. right. Instill that in your kids, please. Instill that in your kids that you're the, you're, the, you're the guides, you're not the references. And if you know any other teachers, convince them of that too. I've seen too many teachers try to think they know as much as they, you know, they, they'll, they'll, show, they'll give you the knowledge. You know? I'm here to show you some of the things I've played with put together, yeah. but I don't know everything, I'm not going to. You don't either, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if I've done that, I'm happy. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, cool. So, so far, I've told you that, it do, that life does neat things. It does that. The, the reason we end up seeing this and that, whatever, is because light ends up bending. 
That's nice. Do you all believe me? I just said I don't know everything, right? Just because I put it on PowerPoint doesn't mean it's true either. So, another, what? <laughs> I got the peanut gallery, this is great. <laughs> so, here's definitely one that I think you wouldn't want to do with your kids. Um, is there light in this room? Can you see it? Where do you see it? What's it? You see it in the bulbs? Where else do you see it? On the walls. Right? So, so far I said, how do you see? And you said you see with your eyes. Now I'm going to ask in a different way. What do your eyes do? They reflect some light, which makes it beautiful. What else? They focus on light that comes in. If it doesn't get in, do you see it? No. Oh. So you've got these beautiful chandeliers here. That's nice. Or sconces, whatever you call them. And they shine some light. You see it when the light comes straight into your eye. Or you see it when the light gets something else and gets bent into your eye, bounces into your eye, reflects into your eye. Somehow it ends up going whichever way you feel. Right? So light, even light, has it does the same thing the baseball would do. Um, you just toss baseball that way? Are you going to hit in the head? No? Good. She's not going to be funny before that. Why not? The ball's going to go until what happens? Until it hits something and now it can bounce back. So we want so is there light on the tables? How'd the light get to the tables? It's reflecting where to come from. Got all these beautiful lights up here. But here's an interesting thing that we usually just neglect. It's gotta get from there to here. Is it passing right in front of your face to do it? Is it hiding right in front of right over your heads and in front of your noses and just right? And we miss it. We've got this be these beautiful streams of light that we just don't notice. And that's one of those things that I hope you can share with your kids is there's this amazing stuff all around you. Some of it just hides. You want to see it? So how can you see it? How can you get the light in the air to bounce to your eyes? So one way is stick a mirror in front. Absolutely. What else can you do? You can put some smoke in the air. Okay? You put something in the air for the stuff to reflect off of. Some dust. Um, you can use uh, baby powder. You can use, um, uh, there should be uh, little um, spray bottle things. So here was the idea when we got things. So I've been talking a lot. I want you guys to use that. So um, the idea was we, we alternated tables for most of these things. So rather than having a whole row of people try to share things, the, this half of the table can turn around to these folks. Then you'll, you'll see one side has more stuff than the other. Um, so you end up bunching around 12 sets of tables. That make sense? Uh, figure it out amongst yourselves, but you should find that every other table has uh, laser pointers and flashlights and some spray bottles. Yeah? So spray bottles are the best one because they're hypoallergenic. Baby powder is great, but it could make people cough. Um, fancy way, of course, is a little bit of. Fog, and now let's see if I can actually start right under that light. Can you see the beam of light from it? Uh, can I put a laser pointer? There you go. So now that is. Can anyone see that yet? What's the problem? You can see a little bit. What's the other problem? There's too much light. One of the other things that's very important for our senses is what the uh, engineers like to call signal-to-noise ratio. You know what that is? Kids, stop streaming. I'm trying to hear this one. Right? If there's lots of, <laughs> lots of some stimulus going on, it's hard to pick out the thing you want. So in this case, we want to get rid of the extra light. So could I ask you to dim everything? <laughs> um, and make it a little bit more obvious. I could do it with this, and I've got some extension cords so people can try with this. You don't need the fancy fog machine. Um, but with the fog machine, you make it a little bit more obvious. This one's having a little bit of an issue. Is there, yeah, the battery's going on that one. Can I see another machine? Oh, that's perfect. Uh, can I have a flashlight or a laser pointer before I step on something? There are also a whole bunch of laser pointers over by the way. There you go. Uh, now, is there a sit? 
So you can do it with baby powder. And I'm not a big fan of baby powder because you end up with, uh, with particles in there. But it does last a little longer. Um, one of my favorites is, who's that spray bottle? Cool. Just start spraying. And you start spraying some mist in there. Now you really start to see it. Right? And I see someone shining a laser already. That's good. Um, so try it in whatever way you like. If you want to try the baby powder one, feel free. Um, and then once everyone's kind of, uh, been playing with it in the air for a while, I'll show you one more fun way to do it. Play. Have fun. If you would like to make this into a challenge, try reflecting that light back and forth across the table. First try doing it without this fog, and then try doing it with, and you'll find how much easier it is when you can see the beam you're playing with. Um, I tell people treat it like a flash, treat it like a screwdriver, 
if you have, if you, uh, if you uh, don't stick it in your eye, you're fine. Um, but uh, uh, it's up to you. Do flashlights work well too? Oh yeah. Flashlights in a lot of ways are more interesting because you can see how the beam diverges. Some of them have quality issues and you'll see it going off to the side. You're just putting your fingers in front of them. Laser pointers are nice though because they stay together. The dangerous part there is of course if it stays together so well. That's okay. Go ahead, do it. Do it! Now you stop. <laughs> Can somebody shine at it? Since, since, the, uh, since the lasers all end up in, in such a small spot, and it's all the same color light, uh, it'll end up being very concentrated in your eye. So you end up, uh, uh, you, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't want to shine a laser in someone's eye for an extended period, because it could end up uh, putting too much power in one spot in your eye. So, Someone said it wasn't, if they, if they have trouble getting their room dark enough, how would you do it if you couldn't get your room dark enough? Put the shades down if you got them, what else? Make a tent, go under a blanket. Any other ideas? Go in a box, that's great. Uh, be careful with going in a box, you don't want to encourage kids to hide in boxes. But yeah, I mean seriously, go to the local hardware store and get one of the refrigerator boxes. You've got a dark room. Um, What's it? What if you don't want so much stuff in the air, you don't want to spray anything? Maybe we can put a couple of things together. This is one that's fun for people to gather around. And it'll give you a little bit more consistency and a little bit more intensity. Um, so shine your flashlight up here for a second. I just want you to see what I'm doing. Thank you. Uh, I have a, uh, uh, I just grabbed some creamers from the, the, the table at the back. You can find any kind of milk. Milk is great. Because milk ends up with solid suspended in liquid, which is what you're doing here. You want here. This is liquid suspending in gas. Whenever you've got different states that are suspended in each other, you end up being able to see. Where in the vanilla, the vanilla really dissolved pretty well, and it, it, it really mixed in nicely. So if you shine your light in here, is it impressive? Actually, there's some bubbles on the front. Let me get rid of those bubbles. Here you go. Anything fun yet? No. Now I'm going to put a little bit of dairy in there. I hope this is dairy. Just a teeny bit of milk. Now let's just see maybe one flashlight. Or better yet, one laser. Can okay, you blow ears? Now you can see what the beam does. You, and by the way, what I would like to encourage, I, don't, I only set up one of these, so there's too many people for everyone to see it. Actually, can I get it that way? Uh, let me see a laser pointer for a second. Can, I, can I just? Um, I was showing you a picture before of light bending as it went from one medium to another. Let's see if you can see it both in the air and in the, in the milk. Can you see it bend? There you go. So now you can see what the light was doing all around you. Uh, turn off the flashlight if you would. Okay. There you go. A little more obvious? That's it. So now you can hopefully see both what, what it's doing in the air and what it's doing when it gets in the water. There you go. See it? So just put a couple of drops of milk you got milk in your center right here. A couple of drops of milk in anything with lots of water, and those, those little drops, those little bits of milk will spread out and reflect the light around. Now you can start seeing what it's doing if you don't want to do it just in the air itself. Good enough? Cool. Okay. Um, nice. So, let's see what's going on. I'm going to open this up a little bit. I don't want to get everyone's eyes too used to uh, the light yet. Is that, should, can we play some more in the dark? Yeah. yeah, she's like, yes, let's play more in the dark. Uh, so this one is the easy one. So we, we just did that. Now, the next one. Our, our eyes live in, oh, by the way, hang on, I just have to do this. Oh, you're, you're, missing, you're missing the show back there. Oh, wow. Don't look at the ceiling. Look what's right in front of you. Look, look at me. Yeah? Yep. Yep. Look, does it need fancy stuff for that? You can do that with any, with any kind of projector. All it's doing, you were making your own projector in the back corner. You were putting your finger over the light to break it up, right? Same idea. Cool. Um, okay. So the next question, do we see, when we see things, we think they're immediately happening, don't we? Are they always immediately happening? No. Are we sometimes seeing in the, in the past? 
light takes some time to travel, doesn't it? So if you look far, far away, you're, you're uh, like, if, I mean, if, you, you've heard the, the, if the sun went out, but if the sun went out, it would take you about eight minutes to notice. Right? When we look at the sun, we're seeing eight minutes ago. When we look at uh, galaxies and stars, we're seeing years and years ago, sometimes millions of years ago, billions and gazillions of years ago. Right? So thinking about your vision is realizing, again, it's a very physical process. They're picking up the light that just happened to get there at the time. Light travels pretty darn fast, so it gets here. That's nice. Um, <laughs> But we also see back in time because of an interesting limitation on our eyes. And honestly, we're kind of exploiting it here. I said I didn't want to get you too used to the light, didn't I? Right? So if you're looking at a bright light and I instantly turn it off, it takes a moment for it to fade in your eye, doesn't it? Right? That moment really lets you see back in time. Because if you have a light and then it disappears, you see where it is. And if I move it, or I turn it off, you see where it just was. If I move it instead of turning it off, you see where it is and where it just was at the same time. And who's done this with their kids? <laughs> <laughs> who, who didn't have a choice but to do this with their kids? <laughs> they hand the kids something that makes light. What's the first thing they're going to do? <laughs> and they're going to end up hitting themselves or their friends in the head with it, right? So I want to give you something that's very safe for them to hit themselves and their friends with. Um, they'll do this. So, You've got a couple of interesting ways to go. One is, take the light, move it, you can draw with it, right? But the other problem, can I, uh, yeah, cool. I'll do it with a laser because it'll be a little more concentrated. If I go from here to there, you can see where it is, right? If you go fast enough, all right? But what if I turn it off and on? Anyone teach drawing yet? If you're starting to draw anything, what do you have to do to get from one side of the page to the other? You take your chalk and pick it up. Right? You don't just go, I'm over here, and I'm over here, and I'm over here. Right? What you do is, you draw over here, pick up the chalk, draw over here, pick up the chalk, draw over here. Right? So you can do broken up shapes, can't you? Yeah. Um, so I gave everyone a toy. <laughs> Some of you were already playing with it. Um, and uh, thanks to the Penn State Cooperative Extension, you can keep those. They're squishy, so please don't, but you can hit each other in the head with them if you want. But the whole point is not just that they're nice necklaces, but you see back in time and you can exploit that to, see, to, to show people a path of where it's been.
And then what your brain does is takes those three sensors, those three types of sensors, and you've got millions of them in the back of your eye, and compares them. And says, oh, okay, so if you see something that's um, orange, right? what uh, colors is orange in between? You're going to be red, uh, uh, Roy G. Viv. So it's between red and? It's between, yeah, and, but then, so if you're looking at something yellow, what's, red, what's yellow in between? Green. Yeah. So if you see something that's yellow, it's going to set up your red cells some, your green cells some, your blue cells not so much. And you see a yellow school bus, what you're really doing is seeing, uh, set, setting off your red cells and your green cells. Your brain takes it and says, I must be seeing something yellow. What if I just shine red light and green light at you? Would you still see yellow? Your brain can't tell the difference. I wasn't planning on going there, but this happened. Take a look at the, the Wonder G logo. And even more interestingly, right at the top, I noted, um, uh, when I was setting it up, I had the pictures of people doing stuff. What color is her shirt? Black. 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 Really? Um, and you, uh, here's what color What color is the, are the molecules? Yellow. The ER. Kind of a piece of the greenish. Yeah? Let me put the red back in. <coughs> you see the yellow? And yeah, check out her shirt. Let's see if I can say again. Yeah, have you ever had this problem with your computer monitor? If you see that problem with the computer monitor where everything looks fine but it's weird color, you're probably either missing your red, missing your blue, or missing your green. All this computer sends to that projector is three colors. That's all you need. And in your TV, all you have is three colors. And you're fooling yourselves into seeing all those colors. And it's the same thing in these uh, uh, brochures. Uh, these are usually done in um, uh, cyan, magenta, uh, so you have, uh, yellow and black, but then you see all the other millions of colors just by mixing it together. So, so you all see the same colors? That's a good question. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's a very good question. Do we all see the same colors? No. no. Some people are. Your blue? That's a very, very good question. How would you know? Can, can you, right, but I mean, honestly, this has always been an interesting philosophical question. I honestly, I, I don't, like, let's say you saw a completely different spectrum of colors from me, and you said, well, so let's say we swapped red and blue, and you learned from when you were in school, in, in preschool, this is, this is blue, and this is, and I'm wearing blue, right? So now, you ask someone, and everyone's answers will line up, won't they? Right, because someone, so the answer is, I have no idea. Um, from... And then there's colorblindness. Then there's colorblindness. So you'd say, oh, it just made me think. My red might be your green. Mm -hmm. I, I guess there's no scientific way to test it? Yeah. Uh, colorblindness there is. Because colorblindness, you can say, can you tell the difference? Yeah. You show, have you ever gone to the doctor, the eye doctor? Yeah. And they show you a picture with a number in it? And did you see the number? Yeah. Then you can tell that then you're not colorblind. I think that person learned to identify that color as a small child as the right color. Well, you know what I mean? they're not necessarily giving you the right color. They're saying there's a difference. <laughs> they're, 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 they're seeing a number because of two different colors. I can't tell you if they were seeing red as red, blue as blue. And there's... Um, sorry. And there was a... Um, um, there's, a, there's a, a rumor, a theory of um, whatever, that um, carried among, uh, it could only be on women. Apparently there's the possibility for seeing four colors. Red, green, blue, and yellow. The so-called mythical tetra tetrachromats. Um, I don't know if it's true, I, uh, nor do I know if they see different colors or if they just see, would see the same thing, just a little more finely. My dad's colorblind, so all his life he knew the sky was blue because his mom told him and everybody else told him the sky was blue, the grass is green. He doesn't really see blue or green, he just sees a shade of a color. So he doesn't know that he has a clue. He just he sees different shades of, um, like he can see yellow, sort of, when he goes into different places where, you know, Pennsylvania, red, yellow, and green. Where you're talking about. He goes to some place where it's sideways, like in Texas is sideways. 
He's totally messed up. He has a clue. He knows the middle one's yellow, but hasn't a clue if right's to the left or right's to the right. The only way he knows what, what colors are is because growing up, he was taught that grass is green. So when he sees grass, he assumes that's green. Makes sense? So I hope while you're thinking about uh, our senses as very physical processes, you also start to realize they're very di differentiated processes, aren't they? We may not all see the same colors the same way. We not, may not be able to differentiate colors from each other. From, from, you know, there are all sorts of different, you know, people learn differently, people also see differently. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. What's up? Um, would you like to know the answer to the right question? Oh, we have Brilliant. <laughs> With a teeny tiny phone, too, you're a trooper. Go for it. Nitrogen doesn't expand and contract with temperature. It's also a larger molecule than oxygen. It doesn't pass through the tire easily. Uh -huh. So it sounds like our guess is what your phone agreed with. That it, since the stuff doesn't condense, won't turn from gas to liquid, it's not going to expand and contract as much. Also, it looks like it permeates less through the surfaces. Awesome. But in order to even talk about that, you have to start thinking about things as pieces, right? As individual molecules, as opposed to stuff. Right? Again, starting to see things in a slightly different paradigm. See things as more discrete tools, discrete physical processes, as opposed to, you know, we've got air. I don't see air, I see individual bits. Uh, well, I don't actually see them. Cool. So, since we're talking about toys, another one of my favorites, um, you guys probably teach a lot with communication, don't you? Yeah. And you're teaching uh, whether things are the same or different, or matching, or safe or dangerous, or all sorts of things. Um, we each see our own picture of the world, don't we? But can we share it with someone else? It gets hard to do. Think about your kids. They're trapped in their own heads. They're trapped in their own bodies, aren't they? If they want to show you what happened at home, or they want to show you what they saw, or what they made, or what they found over time, we're very limited in what we can communicate verbally, especially when we don't have all the words yet. I'm in love with these. I'm absolutely in love with these. Have you seen these before? It's a camera that you can do that with. And it might still work. It's designed to be held by small hands, Binocular vision. It only takes a single picture and the resolution is mediocre. But they work. Um, uh, okay, they do better than the <laughs> So these are a couple of samples of pictures that were taken with it. Not bad. As long as there's enough light in there. And the fun thing is, they make nifty little sounds when they turn on and off, too. And when you take a picture, you hear that? Yeah. So it knows when it's done something. So it's very, it's, it's very instant gratification. Um, again, it comes out in the standard JPEGs, and uh, it saves to SD cards, or you can just pop a little uh, USB plug into it. And now you can have your kids make their own stuff to communicate or to learn. And now they're learning from the things they generated. Um, can you start seeing ways you might be able to use these things in your class? <coughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of getting these into classrooms. These are some of, just some random ideas. You, know, you can make your own learning book of colors, letters, numbers, shapes, objects, body parts. Are these things the same or different to compare? But let kids create their own pictures for those questions. You know, is it alive? Is it dangerous? Should you touch it or should you? Right? Um, things that happen, you know, rather than put it, who puts up pictures from their classes for the parents? Yeah, who sends, sends them home, puts them on the website? Anything like that? Yeah. Um, why not have the kids generate a lot of those? Now they'll start showing them themselves. So any, anytime you can get tools that the kids can use to physically communicate, so much the better. Cool. Okay. So, I think we've pretty well wrapped up vision and extending our vision. So let's transition, shall we? Um, what about touch? And my favorite one with touch is hot and cold, right? Don't touch it if it's too hot, right? What's hot and cold? What even defines hot and cold? This is going to go right back to where we were a second ago with the light thing. And, you know, I know this is green because someone told me it's grass, right? How do we define hot and cold? It's very subjective. It's incredibly subjective. 
Um, if you haven't experienced this one, this is going to be another one of those, kind of like the illusion at the beginning, where I was like, oh, we know what's going on, but it still messes with your sense. Try this. Um, everyone should have on their table uh, some hopefully still reasonably warm water um, and a uh, bucket of ice and uh, three styrofoam bowls. What you want to do is make a bowl of warm water, a bowl of cold water, and a bowl of room temperature water. If there are room temperature things, of, oh, here's, here's cold water in the back uh, and possibly some room temperature water. Should we share a table? Yeah, sure. You don't want to, is it okay if people put their hands in each other's bowls? You're not going to drink out. Just don't let your fingers out. So all I want you to do is feel the temperatures of each one and decide. Here's what I would do. Take one hand, put it in the warm water. Take one hand, put it in the cold water. Feel the difference. Then take each hand and put them in the new, in the warm water, in the, the room temperature water. And see what you notice. See if one, try it one at a time, try them together. Try going from the hot to the cold, from the cold to the hot. And see how incredibly relative your sense of, te of touch really is. Uh, is there room temperature water in pictures too? Have to make it. Okay, can we? Uh, that's smoky.
uh, you can still pick up those very small, very lower frequency of, uh, of the light and just project it itself in, in colors that you can see. So if you, uh, if you have a leaky house, if you look at your house, you can see where all the heat's coming out. You can say, oh, you know, this needs to be fixed up here. Here, but these are, are light is usually the worst. So that's where you know to insulate. Unfortunately, those cameras cost about $5,000. We're currently saving up to get one so we can, that we can project from, so we can start actually doing that with groups, which we love. Um, well, both in terms of, I, I would, one of the things I'm, I'm debating, if we started offering a, uh, a go around and hunt for heat in your, in your house birthday party, do you think that would be fun or do you think no one would do it? <laughs> Not sure. I mean, yeah, we could do, we could do the whole point. I like the education side of it. I want more people to know about it than they can use it themselves. Um, but if we can combine both in the same shot, great. Um, so again, you're taking one sense, you're taking heat and superimposing it on another. So now you've got more information. So a lot of things look like water. Let me give you one more example of that. Um, uh, if you're, you've probably done this with your kids. You put, uh, you get a sack of some sort, you put objects in it, and have them feel it, and they'll decide what's, you know, what's inside, right? So if I do something like that, right, and I have somebody come over and feel it, you can, you can tell what it is. What are you assuming? What, do you, what does it feel like? Feels like a can. What do you assume is in it? Can. Soda, right? How do you know that there's soda? Right? And yet, a lot of times your brain is absolutely certain that it's. A, I mean, in fact, I, I, I could ask you: Is it, is it diet or regular? Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people probably think they have an answer. Do you have an answer? You probably do because you were up here in front. But uh, unless you, that, that whole idea that we superimpose stuff on our senses, we assume things. Um, so. We assume things when we look at them that there's more than what we can actually see. We go one more, and this is a really beautiful one, but it happens really fast. There should be little boxes, these. Um, open these up, um, and if you take a look inside, you'll find it's just a bag filled with, with what looks like water, isn't it? Yeah? Can you tell if it's water or not? <coughs> can't tell. A lot of kids might assume you could. So, again, look out for your limitations. What's that? What's it? An emergency water package? Yeah, so, so if you get thirsty, you just open it up and drink. Uh, you could and you would not die. I can tell you, you want to know what's in here before doing it? Um, what's in here is water mixed with, who's done this one before? So I get this all the time. Oh, you're a science guy. Do you do vinegar and baking soda? <laughs> Who's done vinegar and baking soda in their class? <laughs> you did it yesterday? Did the, did the volcano? Okay, first problem with that. Do you want to do it? Is it a volcano? No. Be careful what you tell your kids. They'll believe it. They'll start looking for the vinegar and baking soda in the real ones. Um, by the way, you can do it more like a real volcano there if you start the reaction at the bottom and then have the gas push the liquid up on top. Now you've got a guy's. But the vinegar and baking soda thing, you've got a whole bunch of very complicated things happening on a very small scale that you don't see, don't you? You've got a vinegar and baking soda, you've got sodium bicarbonate and acetic acid mixing together, the molecules break apart, rearrange, you end up with carbon dioxide gas bubbling out, and you end up with stuff mixed into the water left over, don't you? Then you have to clean it up. Right? What if instead of cleaning it up, you warmed it up, got it to dissolve even more, got those molecules to break up until they were too small and too spread out to even see, so it looked like water again. And while you're at it, do it a little longer so the water starts evaporating. Now you've got stuff that should have started crystallizing again. You ever try to put too much sugar in your tea? And a bun and you get this, this wonderful caked sweet stuff at the bottom when you're done? Yeah? That should have happened here. This is what's left over when you do your vinegar making soda volcano. It's, uh, if you, get, you start with sodium bicarbonate and acetic uh, acid, you end up with sodium acetate and water. It's food. It's food good. Uh, I don't recommend eating it, though. But the interesting thing is they got rid of so much of the water, this stuff should have frozen. This stuff has lots of those solid, lots of those bits that should have crystallized, and they didn't. Just a neat, a, a neat factor of the way this stuff works. Try this. Give it a seed to build on. But I want you to imagine here, you've got a bag not full of water, but full of Lego bits, all sloshing around. What if you started a, a little bit of a base on your Legos? Could, could you build other Legos on it? Yeah. 
So take this little disc and do it when you're ready so everyone that's nearby, like do it in a group, 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 do it in a Pop the disc in there. I know what Oh, that's actually very hot. It says on the package there not to use it with infants. It's freezing. When you put things in the freezer, what are you taking away from them? Their heat. So all this did was freeze here and let the heat out. And if you want to get a little bit more technical, it actually bonded the water into the crystals. So technically, it could have been a physical change, it could have been a chemical change, depending on who you're asking. But as far as I'm concerned, all you did was get those bits to finally freeze together and release their energy. So what do you do with your ice pop after you've frozen it? How do you turn it back into juice? Put the heat back in. These things, no chemical change. Well, I'll say there are no chemical changes. It's still the same molecules. So all you have to do is put this in, in hot water for about five minutes, in boiling water. And those molecules will all break apart again, separate again, look like water again. Let it cool back down. Do it again, and again, and again, and again, over and over and over. It's food grade, and yeah, you can use it forever. Back to the question, when it first started, yeah. it was really hard, and okay. now it is not. So now it's really hard. Huh. It was really hard as a rock. Yeah. It started over here, and now it's not. Interesting. So when it's, she said when it started, it got really hard, and then as they were sitting there flexing it, it got softer. So why would it do that? Any ideas? No, it's not. Remember I, I said the slight misnomer about the way I was explaining it is it's not straight up freezing, it's bonding some of the water into it. So when it was first crystallizing, you were probably, where it was crystallizing, it was making 100%. Okay. Were you sitting there doing that with it? I passed it around. So, so I'm guessing you mixed some of the water that was, see it's still kind of warm. Oh yeah. This will get harder and harder as it cools down. By the end of the session, these things, you should knock them on the table. Uh, I think I had one that I did before. Oh. <laughs> this is what they start to sound like. Yeah, that's how hard it was when I first started. Yeah. 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 But if you put this back in water, if you heat this back up again, you just use water because it won't get too hot. Right. But you put this back in something in hot, you heat it back up, this will go back into solution. And you can do it again and again and again. <laughs> ah, the disc is neat. I tried to start with that. Um, first of all, I'll answer that in two ways. Um, I'm going to give you what I think is my best answer. Big asterisk, looking around, I don't believe there is a definitive answer on this one. Um, from a lot of searching, here's the best answer we managed to get. Um, when you pop that disc, there are all these little creases, these little folds. They expose some, either some very sharp surfaces or surfaces that have crystals stuck inside them. And then all those molecules can start crystallizing around those. That's why I said, imagine you got a thing of Legos. If you had a box full of random Legos, they're not going to stick together. As soon as you start to make a platform, now you can start building your tower on. Right? So I don't know you have like that at home, and I never wondered. I just, you know, you just snap the disc, and this whole thing starts, and you're just like, how the heck did that happen? All I did was snap. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This particular combination is really, it, it's pretty, it's impressive. It's, it, 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 it was what was called super cool. It should have frozen already at the room temperature. It should have been, it should have been like this. But this particular combination of vinegar baking soda and water tends to, can, can, is, very, is pretty stable like that, so it can stay for a while. And then when you pop it, it, it'll go. But yeah, you're right. Those things can hide under your nose all the time. You don't even realize. You the, alter, the alternate answer, by the way, is it's either that they're crystallizing on other crystals, which is, I think, the answer. The other one I've seen is it could be um, that it sends a little shockwave. Which I don't think is true because I've taken them and smacked them as hard as I can. Nothing. 
little pop of the crystal that I'm holding still goes. Again, I don't have all the answers, and frankly, the people that make these, I don't think they fully understand it either. <laughs> <laughs> don't even go to get started with medicine. They have no clue. <laughs> Unfortunately, please leave these on the table. I don't, I, don't have a t I don't have enough for everybody, and they cost a few dollars a piece, so I need to keep these for future sessions. If you want them, get in touch. We can send you some. Um, but uh, uh, the only thing I think that's for keeping, where do I get them? Actually, we're looking for the manufacturer. Um, and we're actually we're, we're looking into making ones. I'm very excited about this. I'm saying it on camera because no one's going to no one's going to do it instead. Right? Um, what we're going to do is. Uh, we're, we're looking to make get them custom uh, custom prepared in a spiral shape, so you see it go and go and go as it warms your hands. Yeah. So, what's that? Uh, this one? The, this one? The, the, this is this one. I, actually, I think this one popped from the car. Okay, the, the temperature, what you're feeling now, it, it only stays warm for a certain period of time. Yeah, it's pretty much done. It's it's letting out heat process. It's pretty it's pretty pretty much there. So it, now it's just going to cool. It'll 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 stay warm for about 20 minutes. Plus or minus. The same stuff we put it that the have the socks. Uh, a lot of times those to be more efficient, they'll let out more heat. It's usually a chemical reaction. You usually can't take those back with any. So I hate those. You have to toss them. So uh, and they're they're not cheap. Well, there are some that are the, the that are just powdered iron. They're, they're usually like half a dollar a piece, but you still have to toss them. Yeah, yeah. And these you can use over and over. Plus, what's most interesting to me is seeing the, that uh, that crystallization. Yeah. yeah. So it's you've got a sensory thing going on. So what a kid's feeling, but also you've got what did you think was going to happen versus what actually happened. You've got something weird going on there. Uh, cool. Uh, we're not. Gonna, I wouldn't bother doing the the sack one. Um, but since we've got we're up to chemicals, can you tell if something is safe to eat or not? Everything looks like water for crying out loud. You know, I mean, sometimes you know because you see something like this and you say, "Oh, it, you know, it, this must be safe to drink, right?" Are there a lot of things that could be discolored? Yeah. There are a lot of things that could be watercolor, it could be whatever. So, are there ways we can extend our senses to safely detect chemicals? Smell. Okay. So, smell is smell a way of picking up chemicals. Could that? Can that also be dangerous? It could be. It depends what you're doing, right? So smell and taste are the, the direct ones, um, but we've got we've got indirect ways of sensing chemicals too, don't we? So what's that? Carbon monoxide detectors. I don't know how they work, but I have one in my house. Yeah, uh, carbon monoxide detectors. I hope you you have them. Yeah. Um, it's an important thing because can you tell the difference between carbon monoxide and oxygen? No. Neither can your body <laughs> until it doesn't work anymore. So so yeah. Um, very, very important. I have no idea how that works either. Could, could we look it up? Absolutely. That's the whole point. The, so, yeah, and that's a, that's a great stepping off point for a discussion of what's that, what's that white thing that keeps beeping on the ceiling? Or hopefully isn't beeping on the ceiling. Uh, well, batteries go and see that. Yeah. Um, if it's beeping, don't sit around and talk about it. <laughs> but, so you can use things to detect chemicals. Do you want to give? Do you have any that you can use with your kids directly? You want an easy one? No. Um, fall colors are some of my favorites. You look around at the leaves. Who, who does leaf prints and leaf collections? And, you know, and when you see those colors, remember how do you see things? What do you see? You see the light that it's reflecting. So that means somehow here, this is reflecting different colors than that one. This one's absorbing different colors than that one, and so forth. Each chemical will will absorb certain colors, right? So by looking at the at the, the light that comes off, you can tell what chemicals are. It is nice, but the chemicals that give those leaves their colors, <coughs> chemicals that give strawberries and flowers and all these beautiful things that are sort of reds and blues and purples and anything in between, um, it's a set of sugars that uh, that plants put out. And the neat thing is. It's usually a sort of, uh, it's a mix of sugars that can change when they're in the presence of other chemicals. You guys have heard of acids and bases by now, I assume. Of course. Um, the neat thing with these sugars, the fancy word for it is anthocyanins. Uh, I'm not a big fan of words. But um, it's a set of sugars that when they get into acids, start turning red all the way up to pink. When they get into uh, bases, 
they turn blue all the way down into green, and, and if they get into really strong bases, they turn yellow. And what you really have is you've got two different sugars that convert from one to the other very freely, very easily, depending on um, acids and bases. So if you throw that stuff in Drano, and it turns yellow, you, you don't even want to smell that stuff. Because it'll, it'll, it'll hurt your, your nose, too. And I've done it. I've tried it. You put it in Drano, it turns bright yellow. Um, but it's really, really easy to get it out of some things. Leaves, they stay in pretty well. Red cabbage, very easy to get it out. Also easy to get it on your hands. So do it on purpose. All you do is very easy, get a red cabbage, chop it up, doesn't matter, small, big, whatever, um, put it in some water, put it in as little water, just, just enough to cover the stuff, and uh, heat it up. You don't have to boil it like nuts, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll get a feel for it. You don't, you don't have to do anything crazy, it comes out really easily. Ten minutes in hot water, it'll probably do it. Half hour if you really want to go down. It should come out to this beautiful, rich purple color. You might see a sample cup of some of that purple stuff on each of your tables, I hope. It should look like this. It's not grape juice, it's red cabbage juice. Um, you should also see two clear liquids. Um, one that's a little sticky, and one that probably isn't a little sticky, but it probably has some white powder mixed into it. Do we do those things with the babies over there? No, no. We can get the babies Okay, sorry. Um, so, okay, take some of that lukewarm water, put a little bit of this in, in one of those sample cups, or you can use the bowls if you want again, either way, um, and put a little bit of baking soda in the water so it mixes up, and then, uh, not, not in the vinegar. There you go. Just take a little bit of baking soda, and a little bit of water, How do you know? and this is way more than you need, just like that, so now you've got samples. And then, in your teams again, um, Take a little bit of the uh, uh, red cabbage, uh, take one of those liquids, put it into either a sample cup or one of the bowls that you were doing the hot cold thing with, and then add some red cabbage juice and see what happens to the color. And then try the other one. Try a little bit of each. Keep, try to keep them separate to start with. See what happens. Mix, do them however you want, just don't mix them all together yet, and then try that afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, Someone tell me where the vinegar is. It's a bottle of... Apparently it was not going around. I, 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 um, okay, so everyone should get some vinegar. I think I've got an extra bottle up here. Um, who does not have vinegar on this side? There's a vinegar bottle going this way, there's a vinegar bottle going this way. Yeah, it's on the paper as acids and bases. I didn't put really detailed instructions on each of these things because hopefully you'll remember what you did and how you did it. And in terms of getting the juice out of the cabbage, it's pretty straightforward. Just put it in a pot, put some water, and heat it up. Okay, you need some baking soda. Uh, baking soda. Can I take this? Thanks. Uh, that's what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I can just meet me in the middle and I'll just make you so to anybody that needs it. Here you go. Put some water in the baking soda so it dissolves. Can we just throw some in here because everything else is water? Oh, uh, let's just have water. You want some liquid with this in it and some vinegar, and you want to test each of them using the, the purple stuff. You can do that in whatever combinations you want, just don't mix the two liquids together yet. Then it'll be useless. So now 
So you don't mix the two clear liquids together. Okay. So water. That is water and baking soda. This is water. Oh, by the way, sir, there are small pipettes on everyone's tables, I think, maybe. Uh, you should, everyone should have a little squirter thing. Please don't squirt each other. You don't get any of my pets? So, uh, okay. This is baking soda and water. Okay. Is anyone else still needing some base? Now what do you do? Okay. Which one is Don't mix Vinegar. Where's the vinegar? If you have an ingredient, we need to keep it moving. Where's the vinegar? We need some vinegar up here. Vinegar up there. Does anyone else still need an acid or a base?
Okay, by the way, you can do this with any acid in any base. There aren't a lot of edible bases around. I don't recommend Drano. Um, uh, baking soda is a good one, but the interesting thing is there's tons of edible acids, aren't there? So you can test for acids and bases however you like. One of my favorite acids, lemon juice. But think about what you can do now with lemon juice, sugar water, and a little bit of baking soda. Now you're making your own fizzy lemonade, aren't you? Yeah. And you can, that, why do you think it's called soda in the first place? Yeah, it was from, from the bicarbonate of soda. So you can do this into sort of a challenge of what can't you see and what's hiding, and how did it all come together and with a tasty treat at the end. My suggestion, though, make the cabbage juice fresh. If you wait more than about a week or two, it'll start to taste a little bit nasty. And then if you, people drink their like purple fuzz, fizzing nastiness, it, it actually doesn't taste that bad. It's pretty bland, but it starts to smell a little bit. Yeah, it, 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 well, you smell it before you taste it, and it's going to set people. Our taste is very much influenced by our sense of smell, right? Has anyone played with that one? We're not going to go there here, but there's a lot you can play with with food and how dependent they are. So, yeah. Uh, cool. So, yeah, what's up? Is cabbage and water a base? Or is cabbage and water the acid? Um, okay. The, uh, when you boil the red cabbage, what you're getting out is, did you see that purple liquid you started with? Yeah. It's purple because I put it in, uh, I, I either, I think I just use tap water. Tap water usually works. If your water, if you turn it blue or red, use the still water instead. Um, but purple is when the stuff is neutral, you end up with an even amount of the reds and the blues. So the red cabbage juice you start with is neither acid nor base. And then when you added some of it to the vinegar, it went that way, the blues turned red, the reds stayed red, and you ended up with something reddish. If, you got, if it started to get like a bright pink, that means it's really acidic, now you're into you know, some crazy stuff. Don't touch it. Um, in the other direction, if it starts to get bluish, that's a mild base, greenish, strong base, and it'll actually go to yellow. Um, so the, the, the baking soda took it from purple to, towards blue. Okay. It's a very good indicator, because it really gives you a wide spectrum. Yeah, you know, Chemistry-wise, it's, it's very useful all across the board, but it's so easy to get. Uh, cool, any other questions on that one? Awesome. By the way, I can tell you, if you make it, if you make too much, you can freeze it, it'll stay fresh forever. I can actually tell you this bottle, we made a big pot of it for a whole bunch of things. We kept this in the, with this one I would say is at least a month old, two months old. And I just took it out of the freezer and just and defrosted it. No problem. Um, so, okay, wrapping this up, let's go to one last one, which is how do you keep your senses, and of course your kids' senses, safe? Because what you were really just doing there was testing for how safe something could be acid or base was. There may be other reasons it's dangerous, but now you've got more information. So how can you keep your senses safe? Right? Obviously don't stick an iPod, so put, put uh, headphones in your ears and turn up the volume so much that you know, it's making your eardrums rattle, right? that'll wear them down. Um, sunglasses are great, don't look at the sun, don't look at lasers, things like that. Basically what you're doing is avoiding extremes. Right? You want to keep, keep things from being too hot, too cold. Right? So there are all sorts of ways to do that. And of course, one of the biggest ones is kids get hurt. Right? They touch things that are sharp. They touch things that are coming at, that are flying at them. Right? So if you want to avoid getting hurt, you need to avoid not hitting something so extremely. You need to reduce the force on, a, on parts of your touch. So let's play with that one for a second, shall we? Um, this is a simple thing that I've, I've done this with in college. This is actually just use this in the college lecture. Um, we're starting to talk about distribution of force and adding on vectors. Um, let's say Nami weighs 300 pounds and she's hanging there. And you've got a little spring scale here. How much force is this feeling? All of it. All of it, yeah. So that's 300 pounds, right? No, he's big. Let's say she's hanging between two things. I just pick 300 because don't make the math easy. She's hanging between two things. How much force is each one of these holding? 150. They divide up, right? What about this one? How much force is each one of these holding with three? Only a hundred each. What if there were ten? Oh, what if there were a hundred? Right, now each one's only holding up three pounds. Do you need a strong thread at that point? 
What if you had a thousand of them? You need a strong thread? The more you can divide up force, the less each part feels that force. You can distribute force. Now let's flip the problem upside down. What if you stepped on one nail and I weighed 300 pounds? How much force is that going to hold up? One nail, 300 pounds of force. Can that little tiny part of my foot hold off 300 pounds of push? No. What if I was standing on 10 nails? Could I do it? Yeah. What if I was standing on 100 nails? Now each one's up, right? What about 1,000 nails? I weigh a little less than 200 pounds, so let's say 200. So if there were 200 nails, each one would be only holding up a pound, right? So, and if I had more than 200, each one would be even less than a pound. Yeah? Sounds like a surgery strip. <laughs> ah! Have you ever heard of the old surgery strip where someone lays on a bed of nails? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, introducing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> Well, if you really believe it, Sorry. There's about 800 nails there. So round it off to 1,000. Each one would only be holding up a fraction of a pound on me, right? So it really doesn't take that much fanciness. It's not a crazy circus thing that you have to be, you know, licensed and whatever. It's really not that bad. <laughs> and you can, you can see it really was pushing on me. But a lot of pieces were pushing on me, weren't they? Yeah. What's that? Volunteer. Should we have someone else later? Yeah. You, uh, you don't have to, you can't volunteer someone else. <laughs> If you would like, if, is there someone that would like to try this themselves? I'll take one volunteer, and then afterwards, I'm, you're more than welcome to come up and play with any individual things. You've been up close the whole time. Come on up. <laughs> Trying to get people from all over as, as I go around. Yeah. Um, the trick, though, is... What's your name? Lauren. She's on three. What's that? She's on three now. So some claim is she's too light. It's not enough force. So anyone else they would like to try afterwards is welcome to, but here's the thing. Don't put one elbow down. Don't put one knee down. Don't put one head down. Because that's going to take too much force on one spot. The trick is you want to very carefully spider walk over it so that your back and your butt very gently come down together. And don't put your head. So come over here. Okay. You might want to try to start over here so you're not even over it. And uh, go, go like you're going to spider walk. Make it take the back of the table. Crab walk. Crab walk. Yeah, like that. There you go. Perfect. And now, uh, you might want to raise your middle up a little bit. There you go. Okay? And then when you're ready, yeah, you're good there. You're good. Okay? You can do it! And you can pick your feet up if you want. You can pick your hands up. Show everyone. Ta-da! The other trick is getting up is the same way. Now, so, was it a magic trick? This is just straight up math taken to its extreme. You're spreading out the force. Right? How does this apply to your kids? In a lot of ways, doesn't it? How does this apply to your kids? Do they smack you into things? Yep. So, what do you want to make sure they're wearing? <laughs> you want to encourage kids to wear protection from a very early age, right? And that's, that, but the thing is, does the helmet get rid of the force? It really doesn't. All it does is spreads it out. Right? All it does is spread out the force over more area. Going the other direction, sometimes you end up with the force in a narrow area. So if you've got something like, well, I'd rather use this than a person. Right? Um, and you know, immediately, it's, 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 if you do something like this, again, this is one of those things kids are experiencing every day they don't often think about. Um, pull one of these out, and they say, cut it open, right? Okay. So you take your knife and you start cutting it open. And they think that's the funniest thing in the world. <laughs> right? And they're going to start falling over themselves to tell you that you're doing it wrong, wrong which is awesome. All of a sudden, they have to do, the people that are supposed to have the, the control and the order don't. Right? It's huge. So there's a whole, you can go 10, you can go years on studying that stuff. Um, but they tell you you're doing it wrong. Why is it wrong? The Am I using too little force? I'm not using the right end. What makes the end right? 
So what does sharp do for you? What's the point of sharp? So how does sharp cut? What's the point there? It's the same amount. Sorry for the pun. The point of, of something sharp is it's the same amount of force, right? But with the same amount of force, here you were dividing that amount of force over this much watermelon. Here, the same amount of force divides over maybe what a millionth of as much water around, just a you know a, a, a small fraction of the, that number of cells. So where this wasn't getting you much at all, and I can I can do it pretty hard, right? And if you've got some real force on it, this is when you can really get hysterical. You can do that. But now kids are just going to be rolling on the floor. Oh my God! You just put a, 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 a helmet on a watermelon. <laughs> I can put a lot of force on this with the correct side. It's going nowhere. The force didn't go away, but it got spread out. In contrast with not spreading it out, it doesn't take much, does it? Right? So this is the same idea behind the better notes. Um, by the way, if you ever switch from a messenger bag to a backpack, it starts to feel a lot more comfortable. Carry the little plastic grocery bags, it starts to slice into your hands. Right? The thicker the padding, right, the wider, the, the, the more you distribute the force. You use this every day yourself. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, now I, I said, you know, I've got things like liquid nitrogen, beds and nails, we do play laser shows, that's the small projectors, things like that. That's nice. But you don't have one of these in your classrooms, do you? You want one? Yeah. You don't want that. Do you want something that's similar? You want to be able to, say, to show the same thing. But without, all, with, without having something you know, dangerous or encouraging people to play with nails, make it yourself. All you need are toilet paper tubes and some rubber bands. Uh, so depending on how fast people are running away, you're welcome to uh, try it. I actually brought a few hundred <laughs> and a few bajillion rubber bands because the mailman brings a bunch of them every day. But all you need to do is 